Uh, welcome back, my dear friends. The party is still going strong. Did you have fun last night? I hope you did. I did. Lots of um, guests came by and uh, helped me out with the stories, which is just lovely, it really is. And guess what? More of the same this evening. So, um, got a selection of stories, and this tonight I'm going to be reading a couple myself, because I just realised I didn't do that last night, did I? Had help in every single story. There will be some ensemble stories again with uh, all-star casts and a couple of guest appearances from other narrators as well. So, without further ado, let's get this party started just again. You got a drink? Ready to sit back? Because you can, you know. You can sit back and relax with your favourite drink, or you can get up and party with me and the gang. <laughs> well, here we go then. Five stories for you this evening, and it is time to get things started. It Wasn't a Reindeer, by Michael Page. Christ, I muttered to myself, as the first flakes of snow started to fall. They gathered in fuzzy clumps over the windshield, before my wipers cleared them away. I'd been waiting for fifteen, no, twenty minutes now, in my sister's driveway. Had I chosen to wait inside with her, I'd have been dead by now from her two grey cats. <sighs> Cute little devils, but a murder to my sinuses. Puffy eyes and a clogged up throat. Yeah, that's just what I needed. Every Christmas our family made the annual trip to my grandparents' cabin tucked away in the woods of Hope, Alaska, and I'd hoped to beat the heavy snowfall that was forecasted. Since my sister's license was suspended from a DUI, here I was, a hostage to time, with my finger tapping anxiously on the steering wheel. When my mother had asked me to be the one to grab my sister, I'd honestly dreaded it from the start. It wasn't that we hated one another, we just weren't as close anymore. After decades of constant arguments and bitter disagreements, our relationship was distant and fizzled. Yes, we were siblings, but it felt more accurate to call us the residue of what siblings once were. Finally, like the gates of Valhalla, her front door opened and out she came. Her hair was forest green. <laughs> the last time I'd seen her, it had been white. The time before that, it was violet. Got everything? I asked as she clambered her way into the passenger seat. Hmm, she responded, as she adjusted her glasses and stuffed a few bags in the back seat. And just like that, we were off. Hope was about a thirty-minute drive, and it didn't take long for the awkward silence to inflate between us. It didn't help that the radio didn't work in my car, and that the broken auxiliary port made your music sound like it was having a seizure. Oh, by the time we reached the turn-off for Hope Highway... The road was turning into a thick white sheet. Thankfully, on Christmas Eve night, the long stretch to Hope's small community was quick and vacant. The cabin was tucked away in a fortress of trees five miles off the main road. As I made the turn, my sister cracked the window, pulling out a blunt and lit it with a lighter. Want a hit? she asked. Snow crunched beneath us. Not while I'm driving. Oh, it's a straight path. We're practically there already. She took a drag and blew it out the window. Oh, I just want to focus on this, all right? She huffed and pushed up her glasses. Well, if you're that worried, maybe slow down a bit then. There was the jab. A piece of bait to lure me into another fight. But I wasn't going to bite. Not this time. She could live with us getting there faster. Well, the drive was almost over. I'd soon be in a warm living room with my feet up and a spiked eggnog in my hand. Bobby Helms, Jingle Bell Rock in the air. I could already hear Uncle Jed spouting off one of his crude jokes. Hey, why does Santa Claus have such a big... Dude, my sister shrieked, jabbing a finger in my side and whipping my mind back to the windshield. And the car had just finished winding around the thick trail. A large body of a reindeer stood in our path. Eyes wide open and blank. It didn't move as the high beams found it. Snapped into a panic, I twisted the wheels in a desperate swerve. The car veered greasily to the side in a fine spray of slosh. The reindeer, also known as a caribou, remained still even as the bumper soared inches from its nose. We came to a crunching halt off the main path. Jeez, I sighed, blessed with relief. Did we hit it? No, my sister said, leaning out the window while exhaling another plume of smoke. 
I wound the steering wheel back around and pressed on the gas. The wheel shrilled in place, kicking up globs of sleep, but not moving an inch. Oh, perfect, I moaned, and unfolded myself from the seat to check it out. The two front tyres were caked in black slush and practically swallowed in a mound of snow. I kicked at it, trying to clear off the icy debris from the treads and beneath the wheel well. When that tired me out, I resorted to scraping it off with my fingers. Ah, screw off, Prancer, I heard my sister call toward the dark silhouette of the reindeer, its antlers like gnarled fingers reaching for the treetops. Then she made a sort of startled yip, followed by a what the fuck? I looked up from the scrim of snow. The reindeer was now standing tall on both of its hind legs. It looked strange, like a silly caricature you'd see in a kid's book. But out there, in the silence of the woods, it was a creepy image. The way its vague shape stood on just two legs held an almost human-like balance. For whatever reason, I realized then, it didn't have a tail. Its muscular neck craned to the side and let out an ululating scream, a miserable squeal of metal grinding against metal. My legs were ice sculptures, cementing me to the spot as the shriek quieted to a succession of wet grunts. The reindeer dropped down to its original posture and stomped heavily. Puffs of white vapour and strings of snot vented from its nostrils. Oh, I was no hunter. But it didn't take a lot to tell me when a pissed-off animal was about to charge. I leapt for the driver's seat, pulled the door open, and slammed it shut just as the muffled thud of hooves reached me. Antlers scraped the door as its large body practically flew over the patch I'd just been standing in. Fast. Very fast. My sister screamed as the large bulk of its frame wound back around and charged again, this time shattering the headlights and submerging us in the darkness. Just go already, my sister hollered in my ear. I'm trying, God damn it! I hissed. The wheels still helplessly spun. We were trapped. The creature charged again, this time nailing the window and blew me a cobweb of cracks near my sister's head. I searched for anything, literally anything that I could use as a weapon. I was never really a gun enthusiast, but at that moment I'd have shaved my head and joined the secular monks if it meant having a Glock in my hand right then and there. After rattling the car once more, the reindeer finally appeared to lose interest and disappeared between the cluster of trees. Granted some time to breathe and think, we phoned our dad and told him about the situation. He was going to come down in his pickup and get us unstuck and out of this mess. I looked over at my sister, who was taking long, steady breaths between her fingers. Are you all right? I asked. What do you think? She grumbled. I told you to slow down. Another jab. And this time I wasn't going to have it. Want to be useful? I yelled. Well, get out there and push. No. Well, shut the hell up. I don't need this right now. She said nothing else, and neither did I, returning once again to the pocket of silence that our relationship had succumbed to. Oh, the sooner Dad's headlights peaked in the distance, the better. Suddenly, she rolled the window down. What are you doing? I asked. Shh, she pursed her lips. Just listen. Humoring her, I waited, and sure enough, the sound reached me too. The quiet voice of a little girl coming from outside. Somebody, it whimpered. I'm lost. Please help me. I'm lost. My sister unlocked the door and motioned to open it. I grabbed her wrist. What are you doing? She snapped. There's someone out there. Just wait a second. It's weird, isn't it? The voice continued to whine choking between sobs and pleading for someone, anyone, to help her. Well, I didn't like the way it sounded. The same lasting drawl between words. The same weeping sounds, like someone was hitting repeat on a speaker. Uh, something wasn't right, and my instincts were hoisting red flags left and right. And then my sister looked at me, and her expression warped into shock. She flung back, pinning both her shoulders against the interior. 
things that sounded like words bubbled up but didn't quite make it out of her throat. I turned and saw what was looking at me. It had the face of a man, surrounded by the mottled fur of a caribou's body. The skin was a mummified brown colour, wound tightly around its long skull like old, crinkled leather. Snowflakes landed against its wide, expressionless eyes and melted into the dark membrane of its pupils. It circled the car, bobbing its antlers and fogging up the windows as it peered inside. My heart shook the walls of my throat. I locked eyes with my sister, unable to say anything behind the sheer disbelief. I should have grabbed my phone, snapped a photo, recorded a video, anything. But my thoughts were jangled. It then let out that same horrible scream, but I didn't see its tight, contorted lips open. The sound was coming from its neck. Small, fleshy orifices, flapping open like mouths, were converted the high-pitched shrill into the mimic cry of a little girl. Help me. I'm lost. Help me. Headlights glazed the area. My father's pickup came into view, paving its way down the path. The reindeer, or whatever the hell it was, ran off, vanishing once again into the snow-covered thicket. Ugh. Nobody believed us. Why would they? If anybody had told me that story, I would have assumed they were hopped up on some crazy psychedelic. But the reality of what I saw was cold, and it's something I still, to this day, can't fully swallow. Instead of sleeping that night, my sister and I did some research that led us to the myth of skinwalkers. Beings of some sort able to mimic voices and disguise themselves as animals to lure people into the woods. After reading other accounts, there wasn't a doubt in my mind what we had witnessed out there. Every so often that night, I'd stare out the window and eye the yard, wondering if I'd see that leathery face watching from the tree line. Neither I nor my sister ever made that trip again, much to the frustration of my family. But there was a silver lining. She and I have never been closer. So, in case you're wondering, that was me. <laughs> you should know that by now, shouldn't you? Yeah, that was one from me, because I didn't read any stories for you last night. Well, I was part of it, wasn't I? Yeah, most of the way along the way. But it wasn't me. Oh, just a story on my own. I really like that one. Yes, it wasn't a reindeer. Very festive indeed. So... What have I got lined up for you next? Well, I'm very, very delighted to introduce to you the one and only Spirit Voices. Now, this is a beautiful, beautiful female narrator, and I highly advise you to check her out after you've listened to this um, party time tonight. Get over to her channel and check her out. Like, subscribe, listen to the stories. You know the drill, don't you? Yes, you do. Well, here we go with the next story. Drip. Drip, drip, by night horizon. Drip, drip, drip. A metronome of decay. The plump sound of death knocking on creamy alabaster, coaxing whatever fool it could with its soothing croon. To feel its embrace, indescribable warmth. Death wasn't a cold hand on the shoulder of the elderly and sick. Oh no, quite the contrary. It was a heated sensuality that crept over goose-bumped skin with a deliberate determination. It was a sentence that intertwined its way into every fleeting second of existence. It was always there, looming and watching, just waiting for the perfect moment in order to introduce itself. Perhaps that was why even its scent was always described as something sweet, almost to the point of sickness. Drip. Toes first. Before plunging into the depths, they sank past the steam that rose in ghostly wisps from the surface of the water. The heat was abusive as Anthony's foot reached the bottom of the porcelain tub, and as the rest of his body began the slow descent, 
He could have sworn the water itself had an infestation of gnawing teeth that pricked his flesh like little needles. The water lapped like forked tongues against his skin, muffling any concern that had bubbled up in the back of his mind. Any fear or second-guessing was easily quelled by the enamoring sensation. With fingers welded to the sides, his knuckles were almost as pale as the rolled cast iron that they clenched as he braced his weight. Drip. Submerged to his waist now, Anthony let his shoulders relax, muscles going slack as his fingers relinquished their vice on the edge of the tub. Saturated in the sultry bath, Anthony's gaze flicked upward to focus on the source of that infernal petter. Above him, dangling just mere inches from his own face, was a sedated body, fresh from the hunt. It hung in suspension by a series of meat hooks, placed purposefully so that they dug in under the skin, deep into the layers of muscle and tendon, to anchor the dead weight. The ankle was a perfect place. The curve of the hook fit so well into the soft flesh just above the heel and under the tendon. The clavicles, too, offered surprising support for the mass of the upper torso, bone and muscle helping to keep the body from ripping from its suspension. There were a few others, fastened into the abdominal muscles to keep the sagging weight from the middle from putting too much tension on the other insertion points. The dripping was the incessant prattle of blood, trickling over supple flesh until it mounted into a drop large enough for gravity to sequester it away and towards the darkening water below. It trailed over bulged sections of flesh, soaking into the twine that was too tightly wrapped around the unconscious figure. It looked as if death had already taken the poor thing, if not for the subtle shift of muscle with each shallow breath that was weakly swaying the chains. Anthony was almost mesmerized by this purgatory, this nuanced position between existence and oblivion. It was a delicacy to see such an unnatural state of life hanging by a perpetual thread. And all Anthony had to do was make one final Snip. It was too easy of a move. An action that felt nearly surreal at the moment as his fingers grasped around the molded handle of his hunting knife. The blade kissed the concrete floor, singing out in a harsh growl as he dragged the instrument from the floor and pressed the soiled edge against a barely visible pulse just below the sweat dampened skin. Even though it was unconscious, Anthony could still catch that jolt of fear run its course through the unfortunate creature. He had, prior to working hooks through the most sturdy areas of the soon-to-be carcass, taken the liberty of sewing its eyes open. It wasn't the most appealing stitch job. He was no seamstress by any means, but it achieved its purpose of allowing him to watch every nuance change as life finally succumbed to its eternal fate. And as the knife embedded itself just under the jaw, forcing out a spray of red that speckled across the tub and the young hunter's face as he delivered the final blow, the ecstasy in Anthony's eyes seemed to be mirrored in those of his fading prey. There was little more than a sudden dilation, a fluttering of the pupil as it contracted and relaxed, as what little hope this poor individual had was drained away. It was as if Anthony had opened up a spigot, letting a spurting, dribbled leak from the freshly deceased into the tub below. The water would have been chilled by now, had it not been for the introduction of that new addition to top it off, still warm from the body that now hung lifeless above him. No longer was there a soft rattle as the chains were moved with desperate inhalations. 
drip. Everything in that moment was devoured by a silence that bordered on deafening. Just the residual dripping of blood splattering against the surface of the water and Anthony's own heartbeat seemed able to avoid being choked out. It was metered, a baseline to some unintelligible lullaby that sounded too familiar, but not familiar enough to place a name to, let alone words or a solid melody. But there was still intimacy weaved in between each drip and every low drum that flooded his ears. Sinking lower into the corrupted bath, he felt the water swaddle him, leaving a red patina of decay as it mounded and slacked away from his skin. The still air echoed over those stained patches with a ghostly whisper. Anthony surrendered himself into the ambiance, listening to the residual plop of blood and the slapping of water against the tub walls. His eyelids drooped, shrouding the edges of his vision with phantom visitors that encroached closer, spectators to this discordant symphony. They towered over him like obliques, stretching infinitely above the still motionless body that stared down with a glassy gaze. That orb-like stare, fenced by shadowed mockeries of an audience, was the last thing he recognized, before the gloom consumed everything. Beautiful, beautiful storytelling there. Thank you so much for being a part of this, this evening, Spirit Voices. I'm very, very glad to have you along for the ride. Go check out our channel. She's doing some phenomenal work. Subscribe, like, comment. You know the drill. Well, time for an ensemble work. You can tell I like saying the word ensemble, can't you? <laughs> well, we've got an all-star lineup for this next one. Who have we got? You're not going to believe this. We've got my good old friend, Unit 522. One of the first people to give me a big break in uh, the storytelling world. I think I had about a hundred subscribers when he had me guest on his channel, and it was a really big boost to um, me and getting things uh, going in the right direction. So we've got Unit 522. We've got Mr. Davis, who's doing some fantastic um, real-life true crime stuff. Um, can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, brilliant stuff. Go check him out. Who else have we got? GM Danielson again. He had a Pretty big star turn last night, and he's back again. I know, yes. <laughs> Who else? All right, don't turn around, and Dead Man Talking's Forest of Fear. So this really is an absolutely star-studded cast for this story. So, here we go. The Twenty Days in Sasha by Chase Lamb <sighs> If you can hear this, this is Chase Lamb. We need help right away. There's something in the woods. It's coming to the door. Oh God, the footsteps are outside the door. Oh my God, it's almost here. End of transmission. Hello, this is Chase Lamb, along with the four other idiots I have with me. Brandon, Mitch, Gordon, and Mike. We met in college while we were studying to be game designers, but we figured out that wasn't for any of us. Instead, we decided to explore the unknown and unexplained. We are what you call um, paranormal explorers. We travel to places that can't be explained and try to bring it into the light for an answer. So today we're heading to a town called Sasha. We got a lead on this from one of those Facebook posts from people going on about, oh, how the scary stuff doesn't exist. The thing that got our attention, though, was when we tried to find it on Google or any mapping system. We weren't able to locate it. Luckily, our local library has some information on it, as well as a couple of old newspaper articles on the town. Oh. According to old books and newspapers that we've read so far, the town has no sign of life. Well, none for nearly 80 years. Nobody can explain it. Why? But it's rumoured that anybody that attempts to stay there for 20 days simply disappears. And on top of it all, they're never found again. 
These apparent warnings given to us raised our curiosity. After doing a lot of research and database searches, we were able to find out where Sasha's location is. Day 1 Since, apparently, nobody has stayed here for 20 days, and we need proof, I brought my journal so I could keep notes. Mitch also brought along his video camera, so you'll be able to watch clips of us at the same time. We're now 20 minutes away from Sasha, and I'm looking forward. Get out of here. Leave now. Uh, a ghostly figure of myself appeared and showed me that. Wake up, Chase. Wake up. Gordon shook me violently. Wait. What happened? I said, dazed and confused. You started to drift off, and it looked like you were falling asleep or passing out. Yeah, I'm fine, Gordon. Don't worry about it. I didn't want to tell him what I'd just seen because, well, he might think I'd been trying to chicken out. I highly doubt they believe me anyway. I just decided to shake the whole thing off as a small dream or some hallucination. So it had been, well, a while since I'd gotten any sleep. Yeah. So Mitch stopped the car, looked at us with a playful look. Welcome to Sasha. Brandon took out the camera and started to film the surroundings around us. Well, they were right about it looking abandoned. It looked like nobody had lived here in years. Oh, the grass was almost seven feet tall. There were cornfields with dead brown pieces of corn all around them. We recorded the area and found nothing except for an old wooden house that was destroyed. Since it's likely no one lives there, we decided that, well, this is where we would set up camp. Day two. Oh, we spent most of the night trimming the hedges, but couldn't do much. Seems like we were trying to trim down metal and steel all in one. Oh, today, the plans for us consist of fixing up the house and making it livable again. We all looked around it and found nothing ghostly or any signs that people had even lived here. All we were able to see were tons of dust or a bunch of spider webs, like the place was trying to tell us that oh, we shouldn't be here. Ah, oh, well, enough of that. I'm going to help the rest of the group get the repairs done. I'll be writing back in my journal in a couple of hours. Well, it took us four hours, but we were able to settle in the house. We all celebrated with a cold beer as we were able to get the electricity in the house, which almost seemed impossible to do. Next thing's dinner. Mitch brought out the camcorder and said in a playful voice, All right, people. For our wait until this ancient evil crap gets us, what do you want? He pulled out a selection of burgers in his left hand, and he brought out a T-bone steak on the right. Well, we all pointed to the left, and we had the burgers. After dinner, we're all exhausted. So this is where I'm going to put the journal down and get some shut-eye. I'll be sure to write tomorrow. You all have a good night. Day four. I feel like a complete fool. Forgot to write in my journal about the third day. <laughs> I apologize for that. Ah, there's nothing I can do about it now. We're all bored from sitting around and just exploring the house. So we decided to have some fun. Took the camcorder to go out and explore the woods. Ah, as expected, we found nothing of talent and fortune. All we saw were trees and, well, insects. However... One thing that stuck out and provided mystery was... How was there a fresh dead deer out here? There'd been no sign of life for 80 years. So how could something be out here? Well, we were all trying to think of possible explanations. Animals get into it. Dying of starvation, natural causes. Eventually we all calmed down and decided to claim that the wildlife had taken it. The rest of the day mostly consisted of us playing cards at the table... Just relaxing until, at 8.30pm, we, well, we heard a banging at the door. Grabbed our gear and went outside, and we were shocked when we saw the deer that was not even dead four hours ago was gone. It's gone. All of it. I mean, the body, the tracks, even the blood. It was almost as if something was coming to clean up a mistake it had made doing its work. Well, that night, none of us got any sleep. Day 5. 
No, I don't claim to believe in the paranormal activity or, well, things like that, but all of last night I heard these, these unexplainable noises. It sounded like small children. Well, every time we went outside, the noise would stop. It was almost as if something knew we were coming to see what it was, and in our state of confusion, we heard a loud, howling screech. When we went outside to investigate the noise, nothing was there. This place keeps on getting creepier and creepier. Day 7 uh, sorry, I haven't ridden in a couple of days. I hit my head and I was in and out of it yesterday. We don't know what caused me to fall. Well, I was thinking there's maybe some weird mold or something in the air. Instead, we found something inexplainable. It was a journal with a key slot. The shape of it looked like it was a diary, but of course, there was no key to be found. Well, instead of bashing it open and seeing what it was inside, we picked the lock Try not to damage the contents. In the meantime, Gordon decided what we were doing was boring. Yeah, he thought it would be fun if we went fishing instead. Ah, we all got our rod and reels. We went fishing for two hours. Oh, to the surprise of everybody, turns out there were fish that were living in the yellow ponds. At the end of our trip, we decided to head back and eat the fish, since well, they looked edible. Oh, we were all excited to head back to the house. But that feeling was slowly turning to panic and fear. Oh, the house looked a total wreck. It looked like a tornado had come in and thrown all our stuff around. Our cameras were distorted, along with all our belongings scattered on the floor. We were frustrated and confused. But I noticed something that nobody else had. The place where the journal lay is torn into pieces. Something was looking for this journal. Well, I'd hidden it in one of the closets and locked it behind me, not telling anyone. But the journal is gone. Someone was here. I don't think it was any of us. Well, we gathered in the room, staring at one another in silence. Okay, who pulled off this prank? Gordon said with fury in his voice. None of us replied. All we could do was look and hope someone would confess and say it was a prank. That didn't happen. Well, we just decided that it would be best to clean up and forget about this mess. But that wouldn't be easy. After we'd finished cleaning the house and putting everything back where it was, we all went to sleep. Within the hour, the other four were all snoring. I couldn't sleep. Not after what had happened today. I tossed and turned, hearing the sound of paper crumpling. I heard it again. And again, it sounded like it was coming from under my bed. So I lifted my bed to see a perfectly intact piece of paper. Day 8. I decided not to tell the others about the paper. I think they suspect me for the big mess that was made. We all went downstairs for breakfast and decided we were going to explore the cornfield later. It was different than the first time I'd seen it. Just as we were putting our plates away, there was a giant thump at the door. It sounded like something had charged at it. We all jumped out of our chairs in shock. Brandon went into a frenzy, reaching in his bag and taking out a gun. And then he ran off. Brandon, stop. What are you doing? We ran after him to stop him. We followed his footsteps, which led to the cornfield. We had to find him before he did something stupid. Or ended up hurting himself. We followed the steps for what felt like an hour. In our hunt, we came across something strange. We found <laughs> this weird footstep in the dirt. It looked like something was walking with five feet, except every footprint was different, almost like every print was a different animal. As we inspected it, we heard a blood-curdling scream to the left of us. It was Brandon. We ran to him, pushing off every piece of corn that came in our way. We got to him and saw him in this fetal position, shaking as blood ran down his body. Some animal had bitten him on the right shoulder. We grabbed him and brought him back into the house. Thankfully, this time, it wasn't torn to shreds. 
but Brandon's shoulder was bleeding, and he was starting to have convulsions. Grabbing a cloth from the bathroom, we made a tourniquet to stop the bleeding, and luckily it worked. Oh, I hadn't noticed, but in all of the commotion, that paper was somehow on the ground. A drop of blood dripped from Brandon's shoulder, hitting the page, only for words to show up. Day 10. I didn't write this yesterday, since we spent the entire day trying to decode the paper. It would only show words with Brandon's blood. We tried ours, but, well, nothing worked. We gathered his blood, and... Deciphering four lines of the page, we, well, after our efforts, we figured out the four lines and what it said. This is Baden Marcus. We were very stupid to come here. The tracks at night are from the animal. We have never seen anything like this. If you see... And it ends there. Everyone was convinced this animal the paper mentioned was the one that left the weird foot track in the dirt. I sat at the door for what seemed like hours and came up with a plan. Yeah, I would sit at the side of the door and when it would appear, I'd take a picture of it. I stood there for an hour, ready to give up before I heard noises coming from the side of the house. Taking the camera, oh, yeah, I saw its face before it ran off into the cornfield. Like a wolf with a scar running from its forehead to its eye. I was looking at the footage to see it up close and to show the guys. When I saw the film, I saw nothing of the animal. I slowed the camera, looking at it frame by frame. All it showed was me running to the back of the house and looking at nothing. Frustrated, I went to bed. Day 11. Ever since Brandon got bit by the animal, he's been acting strange. No, not in a medical way, but he started speaking French randomly, and his emotions turned into anger and depression. Now, well, I'm not a doctor, but this isn't the Brandon I know. Plus, he doesn't even know French. After we helped Brandon get out of bed, we gave him an aspirin and put some peroxide on the bite. Everything was working out. We put a band-aid on to keep anything from getting into the bite. After that, we were all bored and decided to go fishing. We put up a camcorder so if anything could get into the house, we would catch it on film. After a walk to the dock, we got our equipment out and went to get started. I put the rod out and, well, within the first five minutes, I caught a fish on the line. Excited, we pulled it to the surface. And the feeling turned into dust as the reality of our catch came into view. It was a human skull. Well, I thought after seeing this, our next thought would be getting the hell out of this crazy place. I mean, that's what sane people would do. But our stubbornness got to us. We voted together that we were going to stay. After this little voting stage, Mike got thirsty, so we went back to the house to get some water. Thirty minutes passed and he hadn't yet come back. Well, we all started to worry that something had happened to him. So we went back to the house to check on him. When we got there, there was nothing there besides his shirt and the five claw-like footprints. Day 13. Yesterday, the thoughts of my journal didn't even come to my head. The day consisted of trying to find our lost friend. We looked in the plains, in the house, and the cornfields. There was no sign of him. And to make things worse, the footprints were gone. After the search, we couldn't find him or even see any signs he was there. We got our phones out to get a signal to call 911, but no one could get one. The only way to finding Mike was the paper. In a panicked effort, we applied pressure on Brandon's now-healed wound to get blood out and show the final words of the page. Nothing came out, though. In a rage of fury, Mitch threw a book at the wall, breaking a board and revealing the dog skull. 
Well, we were in shock. Went to examine it. It was indeed a dog skull, and by the looks of it, it had been there for a very long time. What in the hell is a dog skull doing here? There's got to be more to this place than just a scary legend. In a curious effort, we took our shovels and dug around the back and front yard to find anything to help us. And what we found was nothing what we would have ever expected. My God, there were bodies. Lots of bodies, not just human bodies. The more we dug, the more bodies we saw. There were so many animals, dogs, cats, and humans. Whatever was here was making it look like a signal to get out, because something did not want us here. Day 14 oh, This is going to be a terse entry. We're getting ready to leave and to go to the police and talk about all of this. We have to report what we found in the yard, and the story about Mike and reporting him missing. Again, we heard something last night when we were investigating. And we saw one of the footprints. Yeah, this, this is it. We're packing and we're leaving first thing tomorrow. Day 15. We're almost done packing. I'm keeping guard at the door with Mitch's gun. If the creature comes to get us, we'll be ready this time. Brandon needs to go to the hospital. His eyes have been getting more bloodshot every hour. And he randomly jerks his body. The rest of the things were packed, and I started carrying Brandon out to the car. God, it's time to get out of this place. God, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse. Oh, well, I was wrong. Our car was destroyed. It looked as if someone had whacked it with a baseball bat for 200 times. The windows are bashed in. The engine looked like someone had dropped it, a giant boulder on it. We had nowhere to go, and no one to contact. And the nearest town is 105 miles away. We were screwed. We're going to die here. The only thing that we could do is hope and pray. Our only hope was the paper. We went to get it, hoping that it may contain some clue, some way to get out of here, anything to get out of this hellhole. Well, we got the paper ready to squirt Brandon's blood all over the pages, not caring how we escaped this place. And when we grabbed the paper, I was shocked to see it was readable. All of the other times we'd seen it, it was blank. It turned out it was a journal, similar to the one that I was writing, except a man named Bernard Jenkins had written it. It explains all the events that had happened to us in the journal, and was a warning. He warns us of a creature that shouldn't even have been born here in this world. It's made this its home, and it will kill anyone that invades its property. Inside is also a video recording from him being questioned by the police. Day 16 Here's the police tape recording we found, taped to the journal. Well, we pulled out our video camera and recorded what came next. Bernard, are you okay? The officer said in a very calm voice. Am I safe? Bernard asks in a very edgy voice. Yes, it can't hurt you, but we need to ask you a couple of questions about what happened in Sasha. He paused. Seven of you went in. One comes out twenty days later. Doesn't look good for you, the officer says. Bernard replies in an earth-shattering voice. It wasn't me. It was that thing. I saw it. It bit all of my friends and killed my Allison. My, my sweet Allison. He puts his hands on his head while shaking violently. She became one of those things. The creature's bloodshot eyes. They came for me, but I, I got away. But every time I close my eyes, I see it. You don't know what it's like. I can't live, I can't sleep. Every second is just me wondering if I can live an extra minute before it comes to get me. The officer seems to be not paying any attention. 
the thing that bit us. It had brown fur, five legs, and we couldn't kill it. We tried shooting it, but it wouldn't die. Bernard starts to shake violently. It wouldn't die! It would not die! The officer grabs Bernard and says, Calm down. You're safe now. His voice is reassuring, but the calm is broken. Suddenly, Bernard yells again. Oh my god! It's right behind you! Camera flips over. Two gunshots fired, and then it ends. The end says that Bernard and the officer were never found in the room where the shots had been fired. All they found were the two bullets. Oh, it's terrifying even to think that the same thing that hunted Bernard is now hunting us. God, what should we do? I mean, it's 105 miles away from a town, and whatever is trying to kill us is driving us to insanity. Is this what it wants? For us to turn on each other one by one? Day 17. All night we heard the growling. Every second I heard it. It wasn't until the littlest sight of sunlight came out that the growling stopped. We were granted with a morning present that had made us all sick to our stomach. At the doorstep was Mike's body. Destroyed and everything. It looked like he'd been ripped in half by a chainsaw. Midge and I couldn't even look at the body. We took a blanket, covered him, and put him into one of the holes we'd previously dug. We promised we'd find the thing that did this to him and Bernard, and we will kill that creature and deliver this evil away from this world. We took all of our weapon-related items ready to hunt, but we were interrupted by another of Brandon's seizures. We thought of what Bernard had said. One of those things. God, was Brandon turning into something else that wasn't human? Well, I loaded my gun and pointed it at Brandon. I almost pulled the trigger, but was interrupted by Gordon. Dude, what the hell are you doing? He tackled me to the ground, yelling those words. I took a deep breath and replied slowly. <sighs> What Brandon said about people turning. We should kill him before he turns. Now, Gordon had the most disgusting expression that I'd ever seen him make. He slapped me in the face and told me never to think that again. After 15 minutes, things calmed down with Brandon. We finished preparing our weapons. At 11pm, we grabbed our guns and were about to walk out the front door. But Brandon was gone. He'd run out the front door and left the house, and there was a train of blood to follow. We instantly thought the worst had happened to him. We heard the sounds of movement somewhere out in the field, though whenever we shone our lights out on the movements, there was nothing there. The blood trail was coming to an end. And then we found Brandon. He was dead. We left his body swearing we'd get a proper burial for him after we killed the creature. We gave up on our search finding the beast at night, we decided to try and find it during the daylight instead. We arrived back at the house and gathered our things for the night. We went to bed and, within a moment of laying down, we were all fast asleep. Day 18 At 3am, a door randomly burst open, and what we saw instantly woke us. It was the creature. It had the head of a bear, followed by scars covering the right side of its face. I immediately grabbed one of the guns and shot at it, dodged my bullet and ran back to the front door. It must have considered me a threat. Before it ran, Gordon swung a baseball bat and hit it in the ribs. But we saw it run off with blood coming from its mouth. We were both excited and happy that it could be hurt, because if it bleeds, it can be killed. No noises were made that night, nor did it show emotion, but you could tell by its movements that it was hurt. It ran, and we chased it outside, but before we could leave, we heard the shatter of glass breaking behind us. It was Brandon. Well, we didn't know if he was alive at all. His eyes were completely bloodshot, 
and foam ran down from his mouth. A thought popped in my head, going back to the things Bernard had said, how it turned people into those creatures. Brandon was now one of those things. He ran at us, not like how an average person should. We heard his bones crack. It made me want to throw up, but I was able to hold it back. Gordon and I ran to the basement as fast as we could, and we boarded up the door. Brandon was still outside, smashing the door and trying to break it. We were frantically looking for something to help us in any way. We spotted an old ham radio. I set it up. With deep breaths, I said, If anyone can hear this, this is Chase Lamb. We need help right now. We're in grave danger. If anyone can hear us, we're in Sasha and need help right away. Just then, the smashing of the door stopped. We heard a howl come from outside. It must have been the creature calling its flock back to its home. After hours of waiting in the basement and listening for any sign of living things in the house, we came out. Exhausted and in pain, we needed sleep. We decided that someone would keep guard and we would switch every three hours. Well, I hope this is a better day than the one we've had in the past. Day 20. It's now the afternoon. We've made a plan to escape Sasha. We don't know how this didn't come across our minds before. <laughs> At the dock, when we first found the skull, there was a boat. Well, it was in decay and looked like it hadn't been used in years. It was our only choice. It was hard abandoning everyone, but Gordon and I just had to. Well, Mitch was missing. Brandon had turned into one of those things. Mike was dead. Well, we gathered the gear, ready to make the fastest run of our lives to the boat. We checked the inside of the house in case Brandon was hiding, or the creature was waiting for us. We looked out the windows and found that everything was the same outside. Well, the saying, looks can be deceiving, couldn't be further from the truth. It was quiet. No footprints were there, and nothing new was outside. We knew it was watching somewhere. I mean, it has to be. Remember, it's the 20th day, and nobody survives 20 days. So we got the bags and all the guns we could and opened the door, running out as fast as we could. Nothing was out of the ordinary, but but this didn't even get us to the thought of slowing down. As if I just jinxed myself, the creature came from the cornfield, screaming and hissing as loud as it could. Looking at its fanged teeth and its wolf-like structure only made me run faster as it ran at us with extraordinary speed. Gordon must have noticed that he was almost near us because I saw him pull the pistol and shoot off three rounds. One hit the creature and we heard it gasp out in desperate pain. I yelled at Gordon to keep shooting, but when he did, the gun jammed. There was no time to fix it, so he threw it and we just kept on running. Halfway to the boat. Oh, we're almost there. We can make it out of here. We were running we suddenly saw it in front of us. It was Brandon, or what used to be Brandon. Blood was spilling from his mouth, and his eyes were completely red. He caught us off guard and tackled Gordon to the ground. I went to help, but Gordon just yelled, saying, Run and save yourself! Well, I had no choice but to listen to my friend and watch as both the creature and Brandon attacked him. Was finally at the dock, and to my surprise I found Mitch working on the boat at a frantic pace. Mitch, what are you doing here? Where were you? He cut me off. I'll tell you everything later, but we just need to escape this place. We jumped on the boat and revved the engine to try and get it to work, but it wouldn't budge. The creature was now in eyesight, and along with it was Gordon and Brandon right behind it. The beast and the rest of them ran at us, and we were about twenty feet away from each other before the engine started. It started. Oh, it started. We drove off slowly into the distance to see the creature, and my two friends, screaming and yelling at us. A tear came down my cheek. 
as reality set in, that I had lost almost everything I would had in my life. I turned to my right to talk to Mitch, but he wasn't there. Instead of sitting in the passenger seat, he was staring back at the town. When I asked if he was all right and turned him around, I saw his eyes were bloodshot. He bit me right before I pushed him off the boat into the propellers, where they broke and sliced him to pieces. And so, I write this, not knowing how long before I turn. But if, for some reason, you get the mad idea that we did and are reading this, run. Run now, never look back. I feel the change is coming. Don't make the same mistake we made. Just turn back and save yourself. Yeah, so a pretty good one there. Now that's one I've been working on for about a year and a half. It's taken me that, just, I don't know, what can I say? I'm very disorganized. Sometimes it just takes me a long, long time to get around to it. Sometimes somebody will post something on the subreddit and I'll just read it the next day. Other times it takes me a year, two years. Um, just happens that way, okay? That's just how I roll with things, <laughs> for the better or the worse. That's just how it is. Now, how are you all doing? You okay? Having a good time? Got a drink in hand? Having a good time and relaxing? Maybe you're at work still? Oh my god, if you're still at work, your thoughts are with me. My thoughts, what am I talking about? My thoughts are with you. I've done that. I've done the uh, Christmas Eve shift many a time when I was younger. And, well, life gets better. You pay your dues, things get better, and one day you'll be at home with your family, not working on Christmas Eve. Now, I can't promise you that, but I hope all the best for you all in the future. So where on earth are we now? Oh, it's my absolute delight to introduce another guest to you. Now, this is a fellow country person of mine now, now that I'm living in the Netherlands. This is the Pumpkin Queen, uh, quite new to the uh, narration game, but well worth checking out. And she has... Quite a fantastic, one of the most popular recent stories on No Sleep, so I hope you're going to enjoy this one. Here we go then, our next story. When all of the children in our town disappeared, everyone was heartbroken. When all of the children in our town reappeared, everyone was terrified. By Bunny B03. When all the children in town disappeared, Everyone was heartbroken. When all the children in town reappeared, everyone was terrified. December 25th, 2018 was the worst day a town had seen since the founding. People called the Christmas of the Lost. My heart yearns to shatter just writing about it. Hundreds of parents laid our gifts under the Christmas tree the night before. Each parent awoke up to an identical scene when they went to sleep. Cookies and milk were untouched, stockings bulged with undisturbed treats, and gifts rested in the places under the Christmas trees, cold from the lack of children's joy. My wife Nina and I were no exception. I remember us tiptoeing past our son's bedroom as we carried his gifts from Santa down the hall. Nina was tipsy on eggnog, and I had a bit of a holiday bus going myself. We giggled and shushed each other as we stumbled through the house. It's one of my best memories, because it's the last time we've ever laughed together. Hell, I can't even remember if we've laughed at all since then. Ronnie was sleeping in his bed, as he always was. I know this because my wife and I bickered about her going in there to give him a goodnight kiss. Looking back, I thank God that she won the battle. It brings me something close to a hint of silence, to know that some of his last moments in this house were spent under his mother's laugh. We set up this tricycle placing the largest yellow bow atop the handlebars that we could find. 
Nina's mother's tradition dedicated that we place an orange at the bottom of his stockings, but the rest was filled with little toys and candy. I groaned as she handed me the full plate of cookies. Ugh, why do we always make so many again? I joked. Because it's fun! I don't know about you, but when Ronnie and I are making them, a small part of me actually believes they'll be eaten by Father Christmas. She blushed as she placed an amber strand of hair behind the dainty ear. The trick peanut butter cups atop of the cookies were killing me that year. I remember choking on my own saliva, turned into a bittery syrup by sugar, who got it done though, leaving exactly one cookie uneaten for Ronnie to sneak in the morning. The milk, however, was all mine. We awoke to the sounds of sirens and the sun shining through our windows. Nina's bedside clock read 9.80 a.m. As much as I tried to fight it, a cold chill enveloped each shell of my body. We knew something was wrong. It's not normal for Ronnie to sleep in past 7 o'clock. But especially not on Christmas. Nina took off running into his room on instinct, fearing that he had left the house and gotten hit by a car or injured. I held my breath, praying to hear his sleepy little voice. But so far, my wife's calls had gone unanswered. Chris! Ronnie's not here! She yelled down the hall. What do you mean he's not here? You haven't even checked the living room. Chris, I'm telling you, our baby is not fucking here. She choked out through sobs. Her footsteps boomed through the house, and I hear the front door slam shut as she left. My breath started coming in faster, and larger puffs as I tried to process the quickly unfolding situation. The rope I wore the night before was disgusting on my skin. Nothing felt right. It's like, in the moment, I already knew that the joy in my life was over. I just couldn't accept it. Thousands of scenarios invaded my rationality. From the corners I'd done so well at keeping them hidden in. Each fear I've ever had as a parent that was always out of reach for someone like me, was now all too tangible. When I opened my front door, I was met with an overwhelming number of sobs and wails. Dozens of people on the streets were outside of their homes. Most of them were crying hysterically. Some wore blank expressions of shock. Others demanded to search every person's home on the block who didn't have children I held my wife as she tumbled to the ground. An officer had told her every child in the country had gone missing Christmas Eve night. My brain fought with itself as to how I should feel. On one hand, hundreds of children kidnapped at the same time would be hard to house and even harder to hide. On the other hand though, the original part of my mind told me that something unnatural had happened altogether and none of us would ever see our children ever again. As the months went on and the seasons changed, most parents in town had reached the same heart-rendering conclusion. Until this morning, Nina and I are still married, though we sleep in separate bedrooms now. She got on this kick right away about trying for another baby, which I was, am, fully against. First off, I felt that if we had another child, we would be replacing Ronnie. Even worse, would be accepting the fact that he was never coming back. We didn't know that. I always held out a heartbreaking hope that they'll find him, find all of the missing kids. Secondly, if something in this town was taking children, 
I certainly didn't want to give them a new target. Nina's screams woke me from a heavily medicated sleep. Chris! It's Ronnie! He's home! The covers are thrown in a corner of the room as I spring out of my now cold bed. Each step closer to my son fills my heart with happiness. I feared I no longer possessed. The long lost and dearly missed sounds of his voice stops me cold. Whoever is talking to Nina is not a little boy. His voice sounds low and detached, like it's being run through a voice synthesizer. My stomach heavens when I finally bring myself to finish taking steps to his bedroom. A mutilated, mangled body lay in the bed that was once meant for a son. Don't get me wrong, he is alive and healthy. He just came back wrong. His face is a mingle of features that seem random at best. It was as if Picasso had genetically designed a human being and brought him to life. One leg is shorter than the other by six inches. His left arm is thinner than the four shades lighter on his right. The left eye placed haphazardly on his face is one of the only qualities that proves to me it's really him. The eye on his right looks like it belongs to someone else entirely. Once again, the street is thick with police officers, but fire rescuers is here this time too. Parents are holding disfigured children as they're late on stretches. Each one yelling about how they're fine and don't need treatment. I caught eyes with the little girl who lived across the street from us, and I recognized one of them as my son's. Whatever happened, it's as if each child was put into a machine, had the DNA all mixed and randomized, then spit back out. The children walk, talk, eat and play like they always have. It's almost impossible to tell whose is whose anymore. It's Christmas. I'm hearing whispers of a reckoning of sorts. The town leaders and religious figures have labeled these children, some of them their own, as abominations. I've heard there will be a massive event to return the children to the melting pots from which they came from. I'm writing this as a warning and for proof for Ronnie down the line to know that his dad and mom love him, and never regret a single thing about who he is. We're taking him the hell out of here. By the time they notice a child missing, we'll be long gone. Surely there's something in the world that will greet him with acceptance and love. We're just happy to have him back. Though... I can't help but wonder what surprises Nina and I will wake up to this Christmas Day morning. Ah, brilliant stuff there from the Pumpkin Queen. So once again, you know the drill. Check her out. Like, subscribe, comment, and everything else that comes with being nice to other people in this festive season. So, oh, party's almost coming to an end. Can you believe it? Yeah, I know. Heartbreaking. Well, of course, the stories don't end. I'll be back again with you very, very soon. Now, tomorrow's a Wednesday, but it's Christmas Day. So just for once, I'm taking a break from the Wednesday night slot. But I will be back with you on Friday, I promise. I absolutely promise. But just to tide you over, one more story from me. Yeah? Sound good? Okay, then. Here we go. Tracks in the Snow by Ryan Brenneman She didn't know where Charlie was, but she could see where he had gone. The snow was thick, and it betrayed Charlie in an instant. Jenna followed the tracks with her eyes and her flashlight away from the house, and up and over the hill. She hesitated. 
She knew exactly where Charlie had snuck off to yet again, and that gave her a pause. Jenna knew her older brother well. They were never apart, except for when he went there when he went to the marsh house across the creek. That's where he was now, over the hill, across the creek, and he was watching it again, trying to see what was inside. How could he? He had left her there, by herself, outside. The thought that she was alone at night finally came to her. She turned, monsters suddenly behind her, but reality blew her nightmares away. There was only darkness there, dotted with specks of late snow. They floated in no particular direction, carefree and unconcerned which way they took. Beyond them, a solid wall of night, so thick that it could drown her if she lowered her flashlight. Silence her. She could face it, chase it back, and walk into the house. She could leave Charlie to his own foolish decisions. But she didn't. She couldn't leave Charlie alone. Not there. Not tonight. Tonight she could finally catch him. She allowed the darkness to follow as she ran up the hill. Trudging through the snow that swallowed her ankles, she kicked and pushed to get over the incline, and she struggled to stay upright as gravity pulled her down the other side. With darkness keeping pace, she knew she couldn't stop. She didn't want to. She only wanted Charlie. The wind whispered in her ear, and she took its sharp tongue from her face. Bushes rose out of the night. Where they grew thinnest, she slipped between them, and she dropped down to the creek bed below. The water was shallowest here, narrow, and she leapt across it with ease. Scampering up the other bank, the cold stabbed at her exhausted lungs with daggers, but she didn't yield. She found Charlie's footprints again, and she chased him. She could have called, but she was across the creek now. This wasn't home anymore. The barren land here was hard beneath the snow. Home was further and further away every second, and her father had told her many times about this place. He warned her that the land over the creek is the marsh's land. She wasn't allowed to play on it, and neither was Charlie. The difference was that Charlie didn't care. The marshes are dead, he had told her. I heard about it at school. Everyone knows they're dead. It's the thing that lives in the house that you've got to watch out for. She never believed him. <laughs> Their mum said it was all nonsense, a tall tale. It wasn't real for Jen, but it was for Charlie. She knew that's why he snuck out at night, into the dark. Isn't that where monsters live? Though the footprints guided her to Charlie, she felt a warmth leak from her eyes as she imagined the darkness behind her growing corporeal. She could feel it scraping her back with claws, nudging her arms as she ran, and breathing down her tiny neck. She could feel every laboured breath coming in sync with hers, just as fast, just as strong, just as overwhelming. Jenna wiped away the tear. Charlie was strong. She could be too. But Jenna was worried. She knew the house was getting near. The snow fell harder now, and with her vision reduced to nothing but black and white, she started to hate Charlie. Truly, she hated him in the way siblings do. How dare he make her run out here, alone, after him? She was going to beat him when she found him. If you find him, the knight whispered. The tracks went on, but it wasn't right. Charlie should have stopped by now. 
He never got too close to the marsh house. Never. Not even he and his friends dared when they tried, and Jenna had watched. They barely went further than the creek, not even halfway to the place. None of them had the guts to go closer. Not Charlie, certainly not alone. So, why had Charlie continued? What did he want? They never saw anything of interest at the marsh house. There was no monster. It wasn't real. So, why had he come so close? What had he seen? Then, as a shape rose from the dark, Jenna realized that she was there. It stood, just at the edge of sight, like a ghost. A legend born from shadow. The home was grey and rotted, and it seemed to stare at her with a stoic face. The windows looked like eyes, and the shutters made it look cross. Hmm, the old marsh house. It was here that Charlie's footsteps stopped. Jenna stared at the prince, heartbroken that she hadn't found Charlie, and terrified that he had brought her so close. She felt betrayed. She couldn't look away. She watched it move. The door was ajar, and it swung in with each and every gust. It was like the house was breathing. The air for each breath raced past her ears and up its stairs and into its dark jaws. She wondered if something watched from within. It was angry. Yes, the house was angry, and she felt shame. So she looked down. The footsteps at her feet hadn't ended. Instead, they had turned. Charlie had turned from the house, and he had left. He'd headed back towards the creek. He'd turned his back on the place, and she would have to as well. But how? It was far too terrible to ignore. So she fell away, slowly, following her brother's backtracks. The house started to slip out of existence once more. It still stared at her as she glanced back to it, and it seemed to change with the light upon it. It looked like it had been betrayed by her departure, enraged. It looked to Jenna like it could, well, that it would, spring up at any moment and follow her. She shuddered and, turning the flashlight away from it, allowed the evil place to drown itself in the night. She whimpered. Charlie's footsteps were different than they'd been before. Before, she could almost match his strides. Now she had to leap from foot to foot if she wished to do the same. He was taking bigger steps. Huge steps. Jenna shook her head. No. He was running. But from what? The thought of the house charging from beyond like some great ravenous beast forced her to stop in her tracks and turn. Nothing followed her, and nothing had followed Charlie either. The only other tracks in the snow were hers. Even though the thought that it was only her and Charlie out there, in the marsh's land, should have comforted her, it didn't. Her breath shook. She trembled, and she could no longer stop the tears from flowing free nor could she stop them from running. Like her brother before, Jenna ran into the night. The creek would come soon, she knew that for sure. Charlie had to be on the other side. He was just ahead. He would be just across the creek, waiting for her. He'd be smiling like an idiot. She knew she'd find him, and everything would be okay. The footprints moved across her sight like cars down a highway. She counted each one as it passed. Soon, very soon, they would turn to feet, turn in to Charlie. Charlie would be there, 
She would cry, she would scream. She would hug him, and they would never go back to that place. Ever. Never again. They would... The tracks stopped. She gasped as she came to a halt. It wasn't possible. It hadn't been like before, when Charlie had turned. No. There was nowhere left to go. The tracks stopped. Dead. There were two prints, side by side in the snow, but then no more. No more prints, and no Charlie. The snow in each direction, except for the back, was still. Unmarred and fresh. The end of the trail was here. But her brother had been plucked from the face of the earth. Charlie was gone. Her face contorting with overwhelming sadness, fear and confusion. Jenna fell to her knees. She finally cried. Charlie, she said to the sky. Charlie, I need you. Where are you, Charlie? Oh, Charlie, come back. She wailed. Kneeling in the snow that late night, Jenna had no idea that Charlie could hear her. In fact, he was forced to watch as she cried out for him. Struggle as he might, there was nothing he could do but watch from above her in the trees. Tears rolled down his face too, and he watched as one rolled down the motley, rotted hand of his captor. The same hand that silenced his own screams of terror. The creature that held him trembled at the sight of his sister. His breath, like fetid flesh, burned hot inside Charlie's nose. It shifted, and Charlie knew that soon it would swoop down from the tree, like it had before, and hoist Jenna up with him. It could do it easily. Both of them, captured one under each of its hideous arms. Its white eyes were wide and shaking in anticipation. Its black tongue licked scaly lips. Charlie shook as the evil thing smiled. There was only one chance. Charlie watched the tear roll down the beast's fingers. It had gathered into a droplet there on the creature's pinky finger. A single drop that was ready to fall as the beast spread its bat-like wings behind them. The droplet trembled. Charlie readied himself, for he knew now what to do. He hoped, he prayed, that if he could just struggle at the right moment, that tear would fall. It would fall onto his beloved sister's face, and she would look up. Maybe then, just maybe, she would have enough time to react, to run. It was too late for Charlie, but his sister wouldn't suffer like he would. She could go home. She shouldn't have come here, but she'd done it for the right reasons. Charlie loved her. He hoped, in the confusion to come, that he would be able to tell her. The beast loosened its grip just for a moment and Charlie pushed. The teardrop fell. Well, my dear friends, I probably had a glass or two of wine too many and it is time for me to sit back and relax with my drink. Now, <laughs> for the rest of the evening, you make sure you have a wonderful holiday season. Remember, I love you all, and thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the support you've shown me over this last year and all the years. I hope I'll see you again in 2020. Lots more stories lined up for you. I'm here to entertain you. Till then, peace on earth, goodwill to all of you. Happy Christmas.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay?